Dear Lord August, Hope you're doing well, Father. Since our last letter, Physic found and recognized some prisoners, but they informed us that they were down a member. Bad Bad Leroy Brown, if I remember correctly. We armed them and left them in the room we found them in to try and find a more expedient exit than the ones that we knew of. It was on that search that we encountered a few more Morlocks digging around, but I managed to put them all down rather swiftly. It was at that point that we realized we probably weren't going to find an easy way out, so we went back, grabbed the farmer prisoners, and sailed them out through the cave which we came through. We then escorted them back to Otari and back to the Osprey Club, where we were generously rewarded by one Hunyazmara. She gave us gold and an alchemical recipe, which Physic discovered a cryptic message on the back. After that, we decided to split up and conquer our individual tasks. Tulak went to the Giant's Whale to talk to Clort about hiring some skilled laborers to maybe dig out the first level of the Gauntlet. Physic went home because he managed to decipher the cryptic message on the back of the recipe. It seems that Yinyasmara had hidden a new specialized weapon under his bed. I went into town to get a new shield. I like the towers because they can protect my legs from further injury, but the heater that I have now, it's much sturdier, much tougher, and made of a much stronger steel, so it should last us a little bit longer between repairs. I hope this letter finds you well, and I'll make sure to write soon. Scott Barber. That's me. Otherwise known as Scoot McBarbs. True. To some. A.K.A. Duncan. Scottrick McBangos. Scottrick McBangos. I can never remember that one. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, newly added to this list today, A.K.A. Scooter Babcock. There we go. You're a man of many nicknames. No relations to Mike Babcock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who or that is. Or Scooter McNary. <laughs> it's hockey. Oh, yeah. There wow. you go. Or Scooter the Barbarian. I did not pronounce Barbarian properly right there. <laughs> uh, Scooter Barbarian. Barbarian. <laughs> that's, uh, that's East Coast talk, everybody. <laughs> uh, I would like you to say a word for me, Scott. Deal. I'm going to type, type it in the Foundry chat. Okay, bring it on. And I want you How to- many syllables? I want you to. <laughs> oh, we'll start with one. Okay, we'll work you work your way up. <laughs> okay, perfect. I gotta I gotta get limbered up here. Uh, try this one on for size. Milk. Very good. Very good. <laughs> he said patronizingly. Okay, try this one. Pillow. Okay. I grew up with some kids that would say milk and pillow. And it drove me nuts. Heathens. Um, yeah. It's a, and it's like a, apparently a semi-common thing for kids to say those ones wrong. Um, I also had a friend that uh, could, you know, w- you know, some kids can't say like they're ours. Uh, they have a hard time like uh, getting them in. And uh, his stepfather would always be like, uh, what do you drive? What do you drive again, Adam? He'd be like, a car. And he'd be like, ha, that's what the crows say. Ka, ka. And he would just like, just make fun of them. <laughs> so terrible. Just ripping um, his child apart. <laughs> uh, I had trouble with my R's as a kid. And A&W had this burger called the Ringer Burger. I still say it kind of fucked up. But it was an onion ring on a cheeseburger. And Yum. I would just like have to lean into that so hard. Say Ringer Burger. <laughs> <laughs> 
When I was a kid, I couldn't say the word wolf, and it was like my oh, favorite yeah? animal, so I'd call them woofs. Oh, nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. My little sister, my stepsister, w- couldn't say discs. It was always discus, and she could not say vinegar to save her life. It was always vinegar. Oh. And when she would draw, she'd be, I'm drawling it, I'm drawling it, and then jumping was drumping. Like, she had all kinds of weird words she couldn't say. That, that, that same friend uh, whose stepfather made fun of him, um, his mom's name was Barb Burke. And no word of a lie, like when he went to a new school, they would like ask him what his, his, his mother's name was. And he was like, Bob Book. And they're like, your mom's name was Bob Book? I'm like, no, Bob Book. <laughs> and he couldn't, couldn't tell them <laughs> what, what their name was. Have oh, you ever met someone kid. that calls a toilet a toilet? Uh, no. That's a no for me. A turlet? Toilet, like a toilet. <laughs> My mother would call it a toilet. <laughs> the first L is an R instead. I have met a few people that say that one. The first L, yeah. So Somebody else, you wait. think you're in toilet? <laughs> Sorry, that's not what I meant to say. I'm dumb. The I, instead of the I, I guess it would be because yeah, toilet. I don't know. Like like put, putting that air in there is actually it's like common in a few uh, UK accents. I think it's called like eroticism. Which you you can almost pinpoint like town by town where they'll just throw R sounds onto vowels. Yeah, I, I actually so like yeah, I, I've, there's there's certain um, ones that I've noticed. There's a pattern that I've noticed uh, in like you know, English, Irish, Scottish accents, and and Australian as well, where you know they don't say the R at the end of a word, but they will if the following word starts with a vowel. Uh, and uh, I did this with uh, a fella uh, that I worked with in Melbourne that. Um, you mean Melbourne? Yeah, Melbourne. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't know what I was talking about. So I was like, say this sentence. Say, I'd like a glass of water. He's like, I'd like a glass of water. And I was like, say this water is cold. And he was like, this water is cold. He was like, holy shit. <laughs> he like stopped him. And he's like, I just said, he was paying attention. He's like, I just said the R because the next word was is. I was like, yep. <laughs> he's like, I had no idea that I do that. I was like, you all do it. It's the strangest thing. I don't know if that's the roticism thing or not, but uh, yeah, I thought it was really, really nifty. It, yeah, it very much is just kind of like, you know. It's like bridging, like, I ha- like in the English language, as far as I know, like saying a vowel sound and then another vowel sound doesn't work very well. Like we don't, we're not able to do it very well. Uh, and so right. we br- that they're basically, because they don't say the R's, they're creating a vowel sound, but but they bridge the gap when they need to. Um, and without thinking is is like my theory. I'm no linguist, that's for sure, but. Yeah, well, there's a few different like ways that the language has evolved around it, where some people will do the roticism, and then if you get into like Scots, like Scot, so, uh, Scottish mm-hmm. uh, accents, mm-hmm. you'll get into glottal stops where they just kind of stop very, very abruptly instead of linking yeah. them together. Uh, language pronunciation. I can't understand what cool they're saying, anyways. <laughs> I tell you what, everyone should watch the sitcom Still Game. And I think it's on Netflix, at least uh, the first like five or six seasons and watch it with subtitles. You'll still have to pause and go look shit up, but it is one unbelievably funny. And I've, I've, I've watched it like repeatedly at this point and I can now watch it without subtitles and I can hear what they're saying. It, it, it took a little bit, but man, it was fun. Hmm. Honestly, after our, our talk last game about sitcoms, I don't trust anybody here's judgment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just before we dive in here, I've got one last word to pronounce. Scott? Telekinetic. (laughs) I had to prepare myself. You have to keep you have to keep that pause <laughs> in the edit because this guy like leaned back and looked look like he, he took a like a, a swallow <laughs> cleared his mouth and his yeah throat. I definitely did I took a second <laughs> gathered myself oh my god you had to think about that like he was trying to move something with his mind <laughs> yeah my mouth in a way that would pronounce those stupid fucking letters oh man tentacular too funny <laughs> tentacular it's, oh, nailed god. it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Watch man. right because, way back. Okay, is it ten- tentacle? tentacle? Tentacle. Tentacular. Yeah. Like a spectacle or a spectacular. That's what throws yeah, me it off. It really all depends on how how the word is spelled. Like is is yeah. it an a or is it an i? It's an a. What uh what suffix is it using? <laughs> you wouldn't guess it, but English was my best uh subject in high school. <laughs> Did you grow up I'm- in a different country? <laughs> 
British Columbia is basically <laughs> uh, Vancouver yeah, but you Island could, is different even yeah, still. In English, like you know, your English class, you don't have to speak it. You're just writing it down. You know, you're writing essays and that sort of thing. You're not you're not giving speeches per se. Oh, we definitely were. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I did I did a bit too. It sucked, but it wasn't it wasn't the meat of the class. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike Math 11, which I had to take three times, I uh, was cruising <laughs> through my English classes with little pronunciation. Did you ever think about just not taking it? Like, did you guys have to have three maths out here? Uh, I had to go to university, so I had to have Math 11 at some uh, point. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> I think like back home, Math Ooh. 11 was, was the minimum requirement. You didn't have to do Math 12, but you had to have Math 11, I'm pretty sure. Right. I had to do that in night school. It really sucked. We only had to have three maths, but there wasn't like a base one in 11. It was, um, that's when you started taking like intro to calculus, intro to um, geometry, or intro to analytics, I think was the other one. Hmm. I took music in school. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a riveting uh, digression. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're still here, listeners, uh, feel free to send in your report cards. <laughs> you can find us on uh, all the major social medias at Uncharted No. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone who lives in every other co- country has lots of questions, especially yeah. our American listeners. Yeah. Donate on Patreon so Scott can practice his math. <laughs> I'm done with it, man. I use a shovel for work, so the world needs ditch diggers. <laughs> oh, At least it's a metric shovel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of, I've got nothing. <laughs> Let's get into the game there, guys. Last thing you were doing uh, was uh, reporting back to Rin. You hadn't seen her in a couple days, actually. You had come to town and left again for the first time without touching base with her. And now you're back again. Um, you've done some research. You've done a few things. And and uh, you have now uh, gone in to tell her about the second level you found below Gauntlet Keep. And she was quite surprised to hear about it because nobody knew it existed. And um, it's about one o'clock in the afternoon when you start that conversation. We'll say it takes most of the afternoon to give her all the details. But from there, you have the rest of the evening and night to do with what you will. What would you like to do? Tulak turns to Rin and says, Rin, you know this pathetic creature, Borbo, I've been telling you about? Tragic indeed. I'd like you to read the stars tonight and let us know if by keeping him alive, are we gaining anything or am I just prolonging his suffering? I am worried that I was rash in keeping this creature alive and perhaps the cosmic caravan can give us some answers. Sage Tulak, as I said, the reading of the cosmic caravan is at your disposal. I will happily do this for you. It is good to know you are strong and confident in your venture now. Yes, when the stars shine, we will do this. Thank you, Ren. Then we shall see you tonight. I think Physic would have wandered down to the Dan, uh, the Dawnflower Library and done some research. Okay. I'd like to do some research on Belcora. Belcora. Okay. Okie dokie. After hearing uh, that pitiful, pitiful goblin trapped in a gem. Did we cap out Town of Otari? Uh, not quite. Okay. Three or four. Yeah. Okay, Dawnflower Library. And what check are you rolling? Oh, uh, what can I do for this one? Can I do a Otari you lore? You can. Well, can it be that <laughs> one, I think? That is a 26. Oh, Damn. DC 15, critical success. Hell yep. yeah. You get th- you get two points for that. Two research points. <laughs> Holy crap. And that puts you at seven points total on that topic. Does uh, not reveal any more information. Note, listeners, it's great to learn because reading is hard. <laughs> 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 we'll shoot that ahead to uh, seven o'clock at night. Two points, really good, but uh, no thresholds met yet. With seven. What's the threshold? Eight? Uh, yeah, this one is, is coming in fours. So the first one was four. Yeah, it'll be eight. In the next okay, one. well, okay. I think that Tulak, upon leaving, is also going to try to gather some information on Belcora. Um, 
And I think that PC recollection is the only one that we need points in. So I will attempt mm-hmm. to. So you can, yeah, you can do a society check or, or a diplomacy to gather information. Yeah, I will be doing diplomacy. So poor roll from Tulak. That is a 14. Oh, you're good at diplomacy too. I know, six on the die. Uh, no such luck, but I mean, that takes you an hour. So maybe you want to try a second one as as uh, Physic is, is doing his two hours of research. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go, Foundry. <laughs> no, one below oh, no. with a 19. Come uh, on, man. Oh, DC 20. No dice. Well, I guess your best <laughs> isn't good enough. Well, Lady Gilly, you've got you've got two hours to kill. What are you doing? <laughs> Uh, she geared up yesterday, so I think, I think she'll spend an hour, uh, trying to hit that Otari threshold with the PC recollection. So she'll, uh, okay. she'll roll a diplomacy to try and get us to the next, uh, the next level there. Okay. That is a 21. Hell yeah. Good job. That'll buddy. do it. And you have completed your research for the town of Otari. Uh, does that give us new information? <laughs> and yeah, just give me a second. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, feel, I'm feeling I'm filling out the things. It's not it's not fast. And that brings you to your uh, next threshold for the town of Otari. And I've just showed you uh, the information there. Basically, Maklani Menhimas, who had you recently you had just learned uh, of beforehand, um, she uh, was Asefna Menhimas own granddaughter. Uh, she had returned to Otari to clear out the kobolds that had taken it over after it had been abandoned. She stayed behind after the rest of her adventuring party had moved on after the reclaiming, and she conceived a plan to revitalize Otari as a lumber town. Taking advantage of the dozens of buildings that still existed in the area, she set to renovating and restoring, and while the Osprey River and surrounding areas were ideal for a mill and lumber yard, there was still one glaring setback. Steep slopes and cliffs that surround the shores of Otari, making it difficult to transport to the sea. Her solution was ingenious. She designed a flume to carry the lumber, the woods, uh, the lumber of the woods uh, to her mill, and then an astounding loading ramp that extends from the top of a 200-foot tall cliff down to the harbor below. You're all very familiar with this. Construction finished in the year uh, 4323 AR, and Maklani became very wealthy. Her mill and flume a resounding success. However, she drew the ire of the Cortos Consortium, who previously had a monopoly, uh, and some would say stranglehold, on lumber across the Isle of Cortos. As a matter of fact, two other factions broke away from the consortium and settled in Otari, each paying for the use of Maklani's invention. The Cortos Consortium is often believed to be nearby, subverting and sabotaging lumber efforts where they can, but never leaving a trace. But for now, Otari remains a thriving town and the largest settlement between Absalom and Diabel, led by Mayor Osef Menhimes, direct descendant of Asefna and Maklani, and proprietor of the Giant's Wheel and Mill. And that is the history of the town of Otari. And there's no other threshold for that. We are done with Otari then. That's it. That's uh, that's Otari as known history is. Okay. Plain and simple. This is, this is a little late. Can I use a hero point to re-roll one of my research? Oh, you are such a cheater. I know, hand was way off the chess piece on that one, but <laughs> while we're in town, I kind of want to see if we can get a little more. Um, I'm going to say no. Sorry. All right, fair enough. Yeah, no, it was a stretch. <laughs> it is way off the chess piece. It yeah. was like five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. That's totally fine. I did all that narration, and you're sitting there not listening, sit, thinking about how you're going to use your hero point. And I was I just staring at the three of them, burning a hole in my pocket. Uh, can I spend my next hour trying to do the PC recollection on uh, Will-O-Wisps? Ah, sure. I think they they specifically have kind of drawn Guild Desire at this point. So, mm-hmm. Okay, go for it. You're going for Diplomacy again? Yeah, it seems like the most appropriate one. Yep. It's also my second highest skill, so uh, that is a 12. Wah, wah. <laughs> Not going to do it. That's fine. I'm, I'm going to hold on to my hero point. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah i have three right now so yeah right i yeah. have two but i feel like uh i feel like 
if if everything goes my way, we're going to be in combat very shortly. I don't like to just openly brag about how many hero points I have, so I'm going to keep that close to my chest. <laughs> Freeman's going to take them all away from me very soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm flush. I'm sure I'll go down in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> All right, it's about 7 p.m. The sun is setting. Head back to Rin's. And um, she is waiting for you, ready to go, and I will roll on her Read the Stars. Whoo! Critical success. She rolled a 35. Natural 19. Hell yeah, we like that. You get the effects of the spell Read Omens. Read Yay. Omens gives you a peek into the future. Choose a particular goal or activity you plan to engage in within one week or an event you expect might happen within one week. You learn a cryptic clue or piece of advice that would help with the chosen event, often in the form of a rhyme or omen. Damn. I okay. love the idea of you trying to rap battle out our... <laughs> Our next question. My name is Freeman, and I'm here to say the oh stars. God. Cut the mic. Cut the mic. Really, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy motherfucking name, too. <laughs> <laughs> He's the sagiest sage of the land. Okay, cut yeah. the mic. <laughs> I could not, could not be more white. <laughs> it's, it's insane. So that may or may not change what you want to ask. In yeah. fact, it's, it's, it's not like augury. It's not asking a question per se. It is choosing a particular goal or activity you plan to engage in within one week and you're not getting a wheel or woe or a wheel and a woe or nothing. You are getting a cryptic clue or piece of advice. I mean, I only think there are two courses of action that we're even looking at right now. One is going deeper into the lighthouse and the other is unearthing the stairs. I don't, I don't know what other goals we have currently. I mean, world peace. The other one is uh, just trying to figure out what to do with Borbo and if I'm being a heinous criminal. Mm. It's not really an action, though, per se, is it? Like, I mean, if by, by keeping him alive. Oh, gotcha. Will we gain any success by keeping him alive? Yeah, I suppose that could, that, could be, that could be considered a particular goal. The goal to retrieve more information from Borbo by keeping him alive. Or the activity of reactivating him to ask questions. Like, you could argue it, I think. Okay. I think that's kind of what Tulak wants to do, just because, I mean, the other ones we're going to be doing anyways. So, it's not really a big deal because it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. This, he is, you know seeing Lady Gilda's response to him keeping him alive, he is feeling a tinge of guilt. And, um, you know, he's not a bad guy and doesn't want him to suffer, so. Yeah, I think Gilda's probably just taking in the whole ceremony. Like, this is, mm -hmm. you know, she only met Rin for the first time today, and she's probably never seen um, a Sybil or an Oracle or or however she feels about this char character before. Mm -hmm. So I think she's just leaning back, following your lead. Assuming and trusting that you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> That's what we do, is know what we're mm -hmm, doing. Mm -hmm. It's just a fancy way for me to justify not making any decisions in character. Okay, well... Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's hard to be morally ambiguous about this because it's pretty clear that the right thing to do is let Borbo die. Like, I don't think... Mm -hmm. There's much to be gained by keeping him alive very much, but at the same time, if there is, like... It would be nice to know. We need any little bit of information we can get. Tulak is going to go ahead and pursue that avenue then. So I guess he is questioning to Rin if the act of keeping him alive will result in more knowledge... And would the activity, I guess, would the activity of bringing him back result in more knowledge to be learned or not? Okay. I'll go get a beer while you figure out a rhyme. No, I'm, <laughs> I don't have a rhyme. I'm going to give you an omen. You see Rin looking straight up through the, uh, the, the circular uh, spot in the center of her shop and, and up at the stars, gazing with those pupilless eyes and tears begin to roll down her face. And you hear a slight whimpering and whining coming from her, her mouth, but like without her deliberately crying. It's very reminiscent of, of, of Borbo's, you know, 
inconsolable state. And then, while there are no doors in this in this shop, uh, but rather a curtain that you did not realize opened to the outside before springs open. Something you had not noticed or seen or would have um, tried to use as an exit. And it opens up and shows you a pathway out. That's your omen. You also all get plus one circumstance bonus to saving throws for 24 hours from this critical success. Well, that's ominous. <laughs> I've been sitting on that for a while. <laughs> Should have kept it there. <laughs> <laughs> Put it right back up your ass, buddy. So it's so we saw a path. A path at which you had not known would be there. Okay. I see. Take two. Well, that's ominous. <laughs> Oh my God! Rule of threes. Next time you say it, it's going to be funny. So uh, no, it's, it's it's absolutely not. I can guarantee that. Oh man, don't encourage him. I don't know what you guys are gleaning from this, but to me, this sounds like maybe he might be able to show us some sort of secret passage. I think you're probably right on that interpretation, there, Scott. I I don't I don't like it, uh, and my character doesn't like it, but I think that's the right way to look at it. Uh, maybe if we put this gem back in him and bring him there, he can show us a, a new way down or a new direction, I guess. This would yeah. be a very, like, uh, almost like a, a, a reasonably conflicting uh, thing for, for Lady Gilda, because if that's true, um, she also still wants to explore the ruins. And you guys are, are also still going through level two to try and um, uh, find uh, more. So it's like, you know. It's suddenly a possibly a very useful piece of information that's hard to hard to turn down. Yeah, probably not that hard for Lady Gilda, but but still enough to give even the most faithful pause. I would imagine coming from the most pragmatic view possible, like it would be best on all fronts to get the information that we can out of Borbo, so we can more quickly put him to peace. So we might as well pursue that avenue as quickly as possible. Yeah, my concern is that this could be um, perceived as taking advantage of or a torturous act, which are two things that are not great for paladins, believe it or not. <laughs> I mean, I definitely see that this is going against Lady Gilda. So Tulak would like to take that information. Is Rin still in a trance or is she come out of it? Uh, she, yeah, she'll come out. So he turns and says, thank you so much for your information. I believe we may have deciphered the omen. And we do appreciate you looking to the Cosmic Caravan for us. We should be leaving, heading back to the Gauntlet as we should put this poor creature out of its misery. This is wise, Sage to Luck, befitting of your title. Before you go, I have something for you. And it is as if the Cosmic Caravan had its surface, for I had not known it was among my many curios and oddities. And she hands you a bag filled with little polished bones. Oh. And this is uh, a slight variant, a flavor, a reflavored variant of what's called cantrip deck. You get a full pack. Uh, I just put it in your inventory. And uh, the description reads, in an effort to spread the knowledge of magic as widely as possible, worshippers of Nethys discovered a way to bind cantrips into cards. In this case, they're onto bones. Accessible even to non-spellcasters. The deck contains thick parchment cards, or bones, each roughly half the size of a playing card, or regular bone, <laughs> uh, in, um, in precise, uh, no-nonsense script. Each card simply states the name of its cantrip, color-coded based on its school. You have 24 cards, and each one represents a different cantrip. And they are all basically consumable. Um, one action to activate or more. Uh, it's an indirect action. And you envision your desired cantrip, causing it uh, the card to rise to the top or the bone to the top of the bag. Uh, and when you draw it out, it casts the cantrip as a first-level spell with a DC of 15, spell attack modifier of plus 5, 
and then the bone will crumble to dust. Very sick. So we can only cast one cantrip one time? One, yes. You have a list of 24 cantrips, all of which you can only use once, and anyone in the party can use them. That's pretty cool. Tulak takes the bag. Thank you very much, Rin. I believe that my companions and I will find this very useful in our adventure to come. I thought as much, and I hope it remains true. And with that, he parts the curtain and heads out of the tent, waiting for the others. During the vision, that that curtain that opened, did it like close after the end of the vision, like, or or did it just stay open? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I'd say it 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 parted, you know, on like a a little rail, like a curtain might be on, and just stayed open. It's it's like a this gust of wind or this light breeze. This little zephyr wandered through Rin's wonders and and just like opened it up, and it's it. What stood out is that you had no idea. That was there. Okay. I think Gilda will follow Tulak out through the uh, through the newly partnered curtain. And Physic as well. I believe we have some answers. I am sorry, Lady Gilda, about prolonging the suffering of this poor creature. But perhaps in his death or his remaining moments of life, he will provide us with an opportunity to save the city of Otari. And I know it's hard to reconcile the life of one to the life of many when it comes to suffering, but I think that maybe in this case, it will do us some good, and I will put him out of his misery as soon as I can. I promise you that. You know, Tulak, it's not the one life for another that's hard for me to parse out. I'm an Andarin. I'm a product of that revolution. I understand holding bullies back. And I, as as a Golden Legionnaire, I certainly understand the value of one life in the grand scheme of things. But also one life for many is, is a choice that I'll happily make. My issue is that we're making the choice for him. He's not making the choice for us. That's That's where my concern comes in. And if we do this, I wonder and I fear that I'll lose favor of Aurori. I understand that this is our best course of action, and, and if it were up to me, I would certainly choose this way to go, this this route, this path, this curtain that's open before us. But the problem is, is it's not up to me. Borbo's a, he's, he's a living being, whether or not he's living in the way that we determine life. He's still conscious enough to make his own decisions when we put that gem in, into that body. It is true, but did he not make the decision to become this way for his master? I actually don't remember. He, he volunteered, but was, was left unfinished and abandoned. Right. And Physic will have just had his head kind of down this entire time, but hearing Gilda speak, he'll say, then you said it's not up to you, then it doesn't have to be up to you. It's up to us. You don't have to make this decision. We can. We're going to do what we think is right. I understand. And I need you to know that I can't be part of this. I can reap the rewards to a certain extent, but unless we want to put the gem back in and leave the decision up to him and maybe try and convince him that this is the right way to go, I don't know if I can be be part of this action and it's i i certainly can't condone it either so as, as as long as you two know my stance and as long as i don't have to be there there might be a way around it but there is still every possibility that i'll lose favor and i'll lose my abilities i'll still be able to punch and and hold my shield up but i wouldn't have any of the other advantages that i have now I understand your concern, and I do take it to heart. I will do this action all on my own and away from you, and I truly hope for the best. I hope it has no recourse on your power and your abilities, as we do need those going forward. I hope so too. More importantly, I hope I can still look myself in the mirror after this. And Tulak nods grimly and turns towards the gauntlet. Are we going back now or are we going back in the morning? 
I was just about to ask you that. <laughs> I thought we'd go at night. I guess it just depends how rested we are at this point. Like, I'd say very. All we've done is lounge around and ask people questions. You came back late and then rested and then spent the day, right? Okay. Let's head towards the gauntlet then. You're going in at night. Oh, baby. Okay. Because you said that with so much enthusiasm, let's really <laughs> <laughs> Nope. Hands off the chest pieces. Uh, all right. You're heading back to ye old fog fen at nighttime. Mm-hmm. You're rested. You've made progress in your research. You got an omen. And you have a, a, a circumstance bonus. All your saving throws from from Rin's critical success for twenty four hours. You filled her in, but it was it was this time not out of a, a massive feeling of necessity, like a desperation. It was, hey, we're doing this. We'd like your thoughts. Not a not a guidance per se. Despite you know, other than the read the stars, you know, you are coming into your own, and you are you know, taking, finally taking this adventure on uh, as your own. It's more of a dedication to the town. Before it was just something for Rin, but this is affecting everybody now. This is now your quest. And it's, it's somehow it's become personal in some way. And you were to see it through. And we level up. Hey, you go all walk down that gone trail and you, and you level up. You absolutely oh, do. Oh, <laughs> oh sweet. Oh, yeah. nice hey, you are I'll ready. take a hero point. <laughs> that is so... I, I was about to say stop gilding the yeah. lily and tell us how you're about to fuck us, but I guess I was way wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, you uh, you walked on that, that trail, uh, you know, this time with, I mean, tremendous confidence by comparison of the first time you walked down it, that's for sure. And yeah, you feel your power growing. And we, we are going to roll over the whole resting for spell slots. Something. That's all just going to be included in. So you, you get everything. You've got it all. Um, and you are now level three. I feel three and a half feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, who wants to describe their level up first? Who's the most eager and or prepared? <laughs> <laughs> I'm chomping, wait, champing at the bit. Champing? No, it's chomping, isn't it? Champing. No, it's, it's not chomping, champing. it's champing. Is it champing? Champing yeah, at the champing. bit. Oh, yeah. Did not know that. Yeah. You see how eager I am? <laughs> You're not just not just eager to tell me we level up, but also to correct my English. How dare you? I am God. Uh, if you want to just bypass him, I am also ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we'll have a roll off. You guys want to roll off and see who goes first? <laughs> No, he can go first. I'm I'm pretty good at these. Go for it, Physic. What do you got? <laughs> okay, Physic at level three. Uh, level three. Uh, okay, Physic at level three gets a uh, skill increase, which will take his crafting up to expert level. Nice. He will now be able to make actual use of his uh, surgeon ability using crafting checks instead of medicine because they've been tied up until now. I will also be taking the quick repair feat. Oh, you're welcome, Gilda. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what does quick repair do? It uh, changes the repair from 10 minutes to one minute. So we can take one minute oh. to repair my shield instead of 10. Wicked quick, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it basically does what it says on the tin. Cool. So that will be my level three alchemist stuff. Uh, at every level, I get one extra infused reagent and two alchemical formulas. Oh, okay. So I've got a couple, a uh, couple nice level three alchemical crafting items to get to here. Number one will be a new mutagen called the Drakeheart mutagen, and I'm pretty excited about this one. You know, uh, much like uh, that Sean Connery movie uh dragon yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> same deal same deal okay you turn into sean connery <laughs> i was about to do an awful pastiche of a sean connery <laughs> impression but i'm not going to subject anybody to oh, it dennis right quaid was in that too um, i forgot oh uh, dennis quaid was in that <laughs> and he he's such a gem i love that guy so the drake heart mutagen is actually pretty huge it uh i'm gonna take it at the medium level because I'm level three now, and it will give a plus five item bonus to AC for 10 minutes and a plus two perception item Holy bonus. Holy crap. 
Yeah, it's a beast. Uh, it does have the drawback of dropping your will saves and your fortitude saves. Okay. But in a pinch, my God, that could be handled. Did you just get a straight five AC bonus? Yeah, buddy. Holy. Uh, wait, no, there's a dex cap of plus two, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, but depending on your build, like, I think we're going to be in good shape here for this party. Yeah, I'd say so. Like, uh, for Guild, Lady Gilda, that's probably just a straight plus five. Yeah, that would be a straight plus five. And yeah. then maybe Physic and, and Tulak are, are minorly impacted by the dex cap, but wow, that's massive. For 10 minutes, you said? 10 minutes. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> You're going to get harder to kill now. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, you're you're thinking. I, I can already see the machinations going in your head of how am I going to turn these all of these now. creatures into elite creatures instead of weak ones. <laughs> <laughs> and then my second formula will be a thunderstone, also at medium level. That is a bomb that does two d four uh thun or sorry two d four sonic damage. Oh, uh, plus two splash damage. Okay, cool. This is a bomb, so you can load it into your new fancy crossbow, which is sweet. Oh my god! I can't, wait for that. <laughs> can't wait to see that in action. I'm gonna do so many bad Scarface impressions. Is it just straight damage, or is there like a save to it? I know some bombs have saves. Yes, Freeman. I'm glad you brought that up because there is a fortitude save involved with that. Oh, okay, cool. But then, like, but that's just if you, just if you throw it with your crossbow. You're not really having to worry about that, eh? You're just adding damage from the bomb to your crossbow attacks. Is, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. You get that. Uh, that base level damage plus the actual That's damage so sick. bomb on top of it. All right, wicked. Is that is that everything from you? How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, good. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's it. Uh, all right, James, why don't you go for it? Uh, Paladin's actually really simple at level three. Uh, the beautiful thing about Pathfinder is like everything goes up. So my AC is now 19 instead of 20 without my shield, or is now 20 instead of 19 without my shield raised. My HP went from 32 to 44. So that was, those are both absolutely huge. And I get a skill increase. So I went from uh, trained to expert in athletics. So I'm now plus uh, okay. 10 to my athletics, which is awesome it pretty much yeah. negates uh the base will dc or the base uh reflex or will or fortitude dcs of things like trip or grapple or any of that stuff oh sweet because i'm now an expert in uh athletics i took a general feat called rapid mantle i don't know how useful this is going to be but i thought it was really great so now whenever i i do a grab an edge check uh, i pull myself onto the surface and i stand so instead of just being like prone, I'm automatically stood up. And instead of using reflex save, I can use my athletics. So I, I can use that plus 10 to now grab an edge. And then I Ooh. automatically stand when I grab an edge. Oh, that's so you can use your athletics instead of reflex. And man, that's so cool. You yeah. know what? I love feats like that because there that's the sort of feat that reminds me that when you grab an edge and you succeed, you don't actually stand up. <laughs> like I, I wouldn't have wouldn't have thought of that. You are prone. So now that's locked in my head. You're, you're welcome, yeah. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else. <laughs> everyone my guild is fucked now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's super cool. Yeah, I, th I, th I think it's a really cool feat. It's not like, it's not crazy, but I think mm. it's going to be one of those utility feats that when I need it, I'm going to be so glad I took it. Heck yeah. Paladin thing I get for third level is I get my divine ally. So I can have a blade ally, a shield ally, or a steed ally. Hmm. And since we're doing a dungeon dive, Freeman has uh, has suggested that I do not take a steed ally, so I don't have an animal companion. Got a got a tight quarters. <laughs> I really did think about trying to get that giant scorpion that I knocked out of my first, <laughs> first session as a steed ally. Yeah, it's dead. I mean, it's like it's like a it's a, but I think that there's a difference between a steed ally and like an animal companion and or a familiar or whatever. Like it's, it probably has far fewer options for you. Uh, it is an animal companion that has the mount action, yeah. So it automatically has that the mount That is pretty ability. cool, actually, yeah. But you, it kind of needs to be a, a size larger than you, too, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's that's the clincher right there. That you're in tight quarters a lot of the time. Um, so the other one that I thought about taking was Shield Ally. Uh, it, it increases my shield's hardness by two, and its HP and break threshold by half. So with this new sturdy shield, instead of being able to block five, I'd be, or instead of being able to block eight, I'd be able to block 10, and its HP would be like 96 uh, as opposed to 64. Mm -hmm. I don't see a whole lot of utility in that for higher levels. So I decided right. to go with Blade Ally. 
uh, select one weapon or hand wrap some mighty blows. So I made sure that I could yeah. take it. <laughs> uh, and for a champion, the tenets of good, every morning I gain a essentially a shifting property rune. So it can be disrupting, ghost touch, returning, or shifting. Oh, that's I've sick. decided that for today, all of my punches, as opposed to being, or as well as being the um, the uh, the striking, uh, hand wraps and mighty blows, they're also disrupting, so they do extra damage against the uh, undead creatures. Dope. Sick. That's awesome. So I do an extra 1d6 positive energy to undead, oh. and if it's a crit, they are enfeebled to one. So now oh. I'll be, Ooh. in three sessions, I've gone from doing 1d6 to 3d6 against the undead. <laughs> That's sick, Amazing. and also great for the ghost touch, too, because yeah, that'll so probably come in handy. In the, and, you know, if we find a, find a creature who's who needs you know piercing or slashing i can you know we spend the night i just change it into a shifting so shifting means i can change the type of damage it does uh between the physical types sorry james i uh, i understand completely but for the listeners that might not um (laughs) you have a rune that you get to change every day yeah essentially uh the damage type it it acts as a rune but i yeah in my daily preparations or my meditation i i can change that rune between shifting disrupting ghost touch and returning so since i use hand wraps and punches i'm probably not throwing it so the return doesn't really yeah. give me a whole lot punch casper in the mouth yeah ghost touch means i can punch uh ghosts or if uh, incorporeal creatures for full damage disrupting means i get an extra 1d6 uh positive to undead and uh, shifting means i can shift it uh as a single action between bludgeoning piercing and slashing types of damage so Ooh. i just love the idea of you like punching and you and then you chop <laughs> yeah and then you poke in the eyes with the two fingers <laughs> <laughs> so again not not crazy but also but, but no it's pretty really cool though yeah 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 really you can see end. how far that's going to go in the long run you can really see it that's that's yeah. exciting yeah oh, that level of adaptability can only be good for us <laughs> and it will encourage resting it's arguable in most systems, especially the most common ones, D&D 5e, Pathfinder 1st Edition, that cl- classes really come into their own at level three. And Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I mean, I would argue, lessens that coming into, coming of age kind of thing a bit, but it's still, I, it still fits that pocket. And uh, and uh, let's see if that's true with Scott. He probably he probably picked pad spells, so maybe it's not true at all, but... Let's uh what do you got? What do you got, Scott? <laughs> Two locks is pretty good at this level. Um, I unlock signature spells, which is pretty sick. So oh, yeah. I get to pick one per level that basically will naturally heighten as I progress. So that's pretty awesome. I also gained a general feat, which I took toughness, so I actually went up ten hit points this level, which is nice. nice. I'm pretty squishy. Mm. Uh skill increase, I took occult as which i know that duncan is already pretty high in occult so it's kind of doubling down on that but at the same time there's some things in i want to be master in so i can take some higher level occult feats that are going to be pretty sick uh as well as it's great because i can use occult when i'm joining past to do some recall knowledge so it's making me a little bit uh more versatile and then yeah second level spells got three of them not going to tell you what they are uh, okay but uh, uh they are pretty fucking sick oh man this is the level where i feel like we can actually start handling our business you know <laughs> it's gonna help like i got some pretty good uh utility spells here that are gonna be nice for us moving around and kind of exploring cool 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 Dear listener, I'd just like to explore the concept of the word hubris. <laughs> <laughs> and or arrogance. <laughs> yeah, before you do that, let's uh, let's rewind the tape and see which one of us has lost a character already. <laughs> uh, and come yeah. close a couple times after that even. Um. <laughs> yeah. R.I.P. Uh, amazing. That's uh, honestly super exciting. I'm so stoked for you guys to be level three. Um, I'm, I always have, I'm always at a, a crossroads as a GM because I love when you guys get more powerful. Uh, it's, I get excited on, on your behalf. Um, uh, but then I also want to sort of kill you sometimes. So <laughs> awesome. Well, you don't have the cojones. <laughs> super cool. Uh, you're going to the gauntlet at night. I'm going to switch foundry map over here. I, I've actually purposely left it on daylight uh, vision right now because I want you to appreciate 
the new map, the redone map by the same guy, uh, Narky, who we've been doing our maps with. He just redid the first level, even though we've already explored it uh, most of the way or pretty much the whole way here. Um, it's incredible. It, it looks is way so nicer. much better. It's yeah. so cool. And um, Damn. I just wanted you guys to see it. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's truly amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's and you can so find cool. his work on uh, patreon.com slash narky. Is that right? Uh, actually, no, I don't think he has a Patreon, but we have we have a link on our website um, f- to, to connect and, and donate to him. And uh, he's usually on Reddit a lot. Uh, he's actually also on our, our uh, public Discord. And um, I'm not worried about us, but the listeners, the listeners, go, yeah, go find like, this guy. Look at his work. Buy him N-A-R-C-H-Y, a coffee. N-A-R-C-H-Y. Uh, he's like... Yeah, he's been doing lots of lots of maps for the official uh, adventure paths, and and they're all really cool. And the fact that he redid this one, I'm really hoping he redoes some of the other ones as well. I, like I said before, I helped him uh, with some corrections in this, and he actually did one that I for, I didn't correct him on, and I, I I meant to talk to him about it, and he already fixed it in this, and it's really cool. Um, nice. But I won't point it out unless you guys uh, hit it up. But yeah, and, it, it uh, looks amazing. Yeah, I will just say if you do head to unchartednorth.ca and go to the thanks section, we do have a little write up about him and where you yeah. can find all of his stuff. Yeah. Nice. And he does it all for free. You know, it's it's awesome. Yeah. Really, really cool member of the community. Cool. Uh, so here you are. Uh, Fog Fen o'clock. What's the plan? When are the workers going to start digging out? Yeah, this, I was uh, just going to say that. You you, uh, you talked to Clort in the afternoon. He said he, he needed a day to figure it out, so you don't know. Okay. You don't know yet. You know how contractors are. Boy, do I ever. <laughs> <laughs> so what actually is our plan here? Like, are we going to enter the main area and just set Borbo loose? Like, or are you guys going to set him loose while Gilda looks around so she can at least feign deniability? I was thinking that we bring him down to... Because he was the, I guess, worker, or, I don't know, butler, I don't know, helper, whatever, for Azenray. Assistant. Acolyte. Assistant. assistant. Think the sure. For. Yeah. <laughs> the assistant for uh, Azenray, who works out of the outbuilding. So I was thinking about taking him back to that building and bringing him back there. Okay. If you guys want to do that, uh, Gilda could search around the main hall like she's kind of wanted to do. She would not be able to stop you because she wouldn't know exactly what's happening. All right. If you are okay splitting the party in the gauntlet at night. Innocence through purposeful ignorance. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think she's counting on Tulak to be like, well, we're just going to go over here and do exactly nothing. We're going to go speak to TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just gonna be over here having culpable deniability. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what I don't know won't piss off my god. Uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, let's go give an unceremonious end to this little turd. As we're walking through, because we had to go through the building as well to get to the outbuilding, we walk through, and Tulak turns to Lady Gilda and says, "If you'd like to search the main building, please." Go ahead now. But if anything comes upon you, run. Come find us. Um, I, I hate to split the party in the evening here. We don't know what happens at night, and it could be terrible. Uh, she looks at her leg support, uh, gives a little tug, and smiles at you kind of sheepishly. I'll be there as fast as I can. I can't promise I'll run, though. Um, and <laughs> Tulak winks at her and says, Okay. Make sure you look down in the south. You'll find a couple interesting rooms there, including the area that we'd like to excavate. Perhaps you can find a plan for the workers before they arrive. Go on about your business, then. I can't believe we split the party. (laughs) Yeah, especially when it's one person. Can we go back to that definition of hubris real quick? (laughs) All right. This could be dangerous for everyone. Let's go with Tulak and Physic first. What... Are you doing exactly? First, Tulak Kate casts Mage Armor on himself. <laughs> yeah, he does. And um, he turns to Physic and says, Physic, let's get this over with quick and come back to Lady Gilda. The sooner the better. Let's go. Do we honestly have to take him anywhere ceremonious to, to just end this, this little guy? All you life? have to do is destroy the soul gem, technically. 
Yeah, I mean... Oh, I thought that maybe, like, he would have to point us in the direction of whatever secret path there was. He doesn't have to do anything. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, it would be easier if we were, like, in a room. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah, I'm following you. Okay, yeah. Uh, Also, would it be fucking horrifying if he sees himself floating in the tank? His old actual body. Yeah, you did not. You did not turn him on uh, in the in that spot. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine he'd be cool with it, seeing his self all pickled. So I think that we're gonna head down into that room. Okay. Yeah, we'll go back to Asenray's little workshop there where he pickled a goblin. All right. And then also, I would like to say that we are avoiding notice, if I can speak for Duncan as well. Oh, you can speak for me all the time. You're much more <laughs> verbose than I. <laughs> That is so much farther away than I thought you guys were going to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah, the party is split. Party is proper split. Real split. Uh, I thought you guys were just going to go to like the first level of the workshop and turn them on. Because uh, we already did find a secret door in that workshop. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, <laughs> too late now. Uh, you guys should be on the other map in the appropriate spot. Uh, listeners, we are on different maps now. Different maps. Uh, I also would like to say um, if it's not too late, Tulak ca- uh, cast light on the uh, hand wraps of Lady Gilda before they leave, and then lights a torch for himself. Uh, on the shield okay. now, please. Oh, shield. Yep. You got it. What's the bulk <laughs> of the shield? Uh, one. So I went down from mm. the tower shield to uh, the sturdy shield, so it's a little little heater now. Suck it, Barn. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say it's been nice knowing yeah. you fellas glad we made it to level three together okay so you are in the uh the workshop in which you found this soulbound doll tulak will set down the doll on the desk with his back to the tank okay and inserts the soul gem and it springs to life with a big old cry <laughs> oh, fuck, I forget this <laughs> Porbo, calm yourself. We have brought you back to your home. Roll me a diplomacy. Okay, here we go. Yikes. It's a natural one. <laughs> oh, no. For a 10. <laughs> oh. This is going well. Uh, I would like to use a hero point to reroll that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, re rolling with a hero point. If you insist. Oh, God. It's still <laughs> shitty. Uh, 15 with my plus nine. Perfect. Oh, it keeps crying. It keeps crying. <laughs> Tulak turns him and gets really close to him and says, Borbo, pull yourself together or I will not destroy you and you will live on in agony. Okay, now it's intimidation. <laughs> Hell yeah. 27. Yikes. <laughs> Borbo, sorry. Do you see where we are, Borbo? Uh, is, is, is Master's, Master's workshop. <gasps> Do you remember this place? Bor- Borbo volunteered here. Borbo spent lots of time here. <gasps> Borbo, have you been to other places within this area and also the Gauntlet Keep? Um, B- Borbo's room is, is down the hall, and 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 some sometimes he would go up top in the workshop with the gl- glass and then some sometimes but only only sometimes the mean old mistress belcor uh, i would be in her uh, office do you know of a secret passage uh and he he like stops sobbing for a sec jolted by the question yes Borbo f- forgot. Borbo doesn't like to think about mistress. But yes, there is a spot. Tulak is has changed his demeanor since intimidating him, mm-hmm. but stays close. Borbo, tell us, tell us about this passage. Tell us where you found it and where it leads. 
<laughs> there's there's a, a, a sh shelf, a shelf, and it it turns, it, it rotates, <laughs> and and it it goes it goes down into uh, where the guards used to be. <laughs> ah, the guards down down below. Is that in Belcora's office? Yes. Thank you, Borbo. Do you have anything else you'd like to tell us? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Do you have family? Do you have anything? Only master. <laughs> do you wish to stay alive to see if your master is still alive, or do you wish to be put to rest now? Borbo can't choose. Borbo wants both. Borbo wants one more. <laughs> Which do you want more, Borbo? Take the power into your own hands, and I will do whatever you say. <sighs> release. Borbo wants release. Tulok looks him dead in the eyes and says, Good night, sweet prince, and pulls out <laughs> the soul gem, puts it on the ground, and stomps on it. And it shatters. The soul is freed. And you gain a boon from Phrasma. Ooh. For setting the soul free and allowing it to travel to the boneyard. You have one full month to optionally apply to a single check, a plus two status bonus. Ooh. At your choice. I do love how Tulak just went through a full good cop, bad cop interrogation <laughs> routine by himself. That was badass. <laughs> that was yeah. so good, man. So Tulak takes the body of Borbo and puts it into his traveling pack, turns to Physic and says, Come, let's find Lady Gilda. We have all we need here. Yeah, and Physic has just been kind of aghast by the whole scene like he's th thought he was more comfortable with it before it came down to the humanity of actually extinguishing a life so he's just kind of silently following along and before they leave in the torchlight Tulak regards the body of the real Borbo in the tank takes a moment and then walks away hero point Hey, it's gotta be. It's gotta be. That was awesome. That was so badass. <laughs> uh, all right, you travel your way back uh, up, but um, we should now go to Lady Gilda. What are you up to? Uh, she's just taking the search action, just meticulously searching, walking around these rooms, just mm -hmm. doing her thing. You're in the famous L-shaped hallway at the moment, searching around. You see, at this point, like decaying. Um, bodies of Mitflits left behind, giant maggot. Um, you can see the door open to the sinkhole, more Mitflit bodies hanging around. Uh, what uh, what ways do you go? Uh, she'll just walk along the walls of this hallway to start with. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to find any evidence of whatever you can, eh? Yeah, she's just searching around. Um like she'd been made aware of this secret room uh, with the teleportation circle mm. in it specifically. So she's kind of just looking for that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So she's just like walking around the room. Um, all of these doors are open. So she looks in the rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, but this door doesn't appear to be open. Can you see through though? Yeah, I, I can see through. Yeah, yeah that's just, uh, it's just a static door on the map. It's open. So, you know, she looks into this room down here and sees the, the giant frog and the, the corpses. She looks into mm -hmm. this room and sees the collapsed, uh, looks in, sees the sink pit, you know, sees the drawbridge. This room, I don't think they've really said anything about. Like, this is just appears to be a study. Yeah, that, that is one that this is one that you get the original party, like, just sort of waltzed through and the next one as well. The next one, they found the secret door. Yeah. yeah, I know that. But, you know, she, like, I don't imagine it really came up. So she's going to uh, search in this room as well. So she just spends the, the time searching around. Uh, yeah. And you search around, but you, you don't. Yeah, you're right. It looks like a study or an office. There's some shelves kicking around that might have carried books and papers at one point. But everything's been rotted a long, long time ago. There's a desk and a chair. 
to the uh, northeast, but that's it. Okay. What uh, what route are you taking back, Physic and Tulak? Remind me, in the circular room of the lighthouse, did we ever mm-hmm. end up opening that southern facing door? You did not. No, that was that one was like jarred shut. It needs to be like it needs to be forced open. It's like rotted in its frame, and it needs to be like pushed down. Essentially, it can't just then, be opened normally. I think we're just taking the same path over the bridge around the western side and then through the collapse wall. I imagine as you pass by that door to on the eastern side of the of the lighthouse um, is still open and um, you pass by and probably can't help but glance in and that is that is one thing I will point out uh, is that uh, that room um, is what one of the things that Narky changed on the map um, and it's supposed to be not decayed at all. Um, so I don't know if you can see into it right now with the, the way I have it set up, but I'll throw you in there real quick and you can just see that it's like no longer decayed. It's like a proper room. Yeah. Still has nice yeah. brickwork and all that. Everything. Yeah. Not, yeah. It's really, really nice. Yeah. It's cool. Conspicuously well maintained. Yeah. Is the pool of blood still a pool of blood? Sure is. And you can see it rippling as per usual. We continue past. <laughs> <laughs> Avoiding notice, sir. Yeah, as you would. <laughs> Don't want that blood to see you. And, you're, and wh- where is it in the keep you're looking to go to next? Basically to find Lady Gilda and then to the office. Okay, so I'll just drag you both to the old L-shaped hallway. By this time, I imagine she would have made it over to like the um, the doors for the outer chapel. She's just given, given, a, uh, given those a go. Like She knows she fought the scorpion on the other side of these doors, really? Yeah. Well, that, yeah, those those doors in particular are like piled up with rubble. They're not just closed and locked. They're just like it's a mass of rubble. Like that's and that's blocked there's a them. trap sitting there. <laughs> there is a trap sitting there. That's right. <laughs> I forgot I about that. I thought the trap was over here. <laughs> oh, was it? Was it? Oh, oh yeah. I don't <laughs> oh yeah. I, just, okay, I know yeah, there's yeah, one in the, the, in the original outbuilding, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. But the the first snare we 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 took is in this neighborhood. Um, because he wanted to make sure that nobody could sneak up on us. Right. So he comes around the corner and sees Lady Gilda. And says, Lady Gilda, we have put Borbo to peace at his own choice. And we've some other information as well. Follow me. And he heads into the office. All business. <laughs> and you immediately start looking for shelves. And you see one. You see a couple. You grab them, give them a little touch, a little tug, and one of them rotates at the slightest pull and reveals a secret door. Level up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it goes it goes down a level. It oh, down yeah, a, yeah, my bad. I yeah. can tell. Level down. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> We've all seen the Adams family. We know how these trap doors work <laughs> yeah. in the bookcase. Yeah, it opens this this very, very narrow staircase that leads downward. All right. I didn't exactly predict that you would come out of it with this direct of information, but I'm glad he's at peace now. And we have our our route of egress. Uh, Does she still feel the blessings of Aurora? Absolutely. And now we have our egress. You're right. We still don't know where they lead down, though. Care to lead the way? I'm ready if you are. So she takes the defend action, gets in front her glowing new sturdy shields, and she will slowly, defending, head down the stairs. Nice. And I follow. Okay. And Physic drags his feet behind them. (laughs) This is really cool. And at the end of the hall, they see a door, which we will she will listen against, I guess. Yes. And you hear nothing. I will cantrip detect magic. You detect nothing. She opens the door. You crack the door and you see a 15 by 15 foot room. Three plain wooden chairs sit along the east wall and it is otherwise empty. Although the middle chair is leaned up on its back legs against the wall. Tulak like squeezes Lady Gilda on the shoulder and says, I should mention, Borbo did say this room led into a chamber for guards or soldiers. 
So, stay alert. She just nods, and she puts her foot on the seat of the chair to push it down so it's no longer leaning on its back legs. And it becomes immediately evident to you that there's a section of wall behind it that is absolutely a secret door. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Did not expect that. <laughs> and you wouldn't have because you walked down the hallway that it leads to, that processional hallway. Yeah. And it, I, and I remember I rolled a ridiculously high check for one of you and you still didn't see it. It is remarkably hidden from the other side. Not so much this side, but it's like a DC 28 check or something like that. It's something ludicrous at this level. Wow. Yeah. Um, would, would she be able to extrapolate that it leads to the processional hall? Uh, I would say probably not. Uh, although I'll, I'll roll, a will roll a perception check to see if you, you've, you've got your geographical bearings. Yeah. Survival or a dungeoneering. Yeah. As a natural one, you don't know. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, you could crack it open and, and, and do a d quick check if you're feeling brave. <laughs> yeah. I think she points it out to, uh, like quietly points it out to Tulak and Physic and then just kind of gestures with both hands up. Like which direction do we go? Trying to stay as quiet as possible, even though she's not particularly stealthy. Yeah. Uh, Tulak wants to do a quick search of the room to see if there's anything in here and then we'll move towards the east uh, western door sorry okay. okay and you you don't see anything it is barren and empty other than the three chairs it's like really quite stark to be honest barren, not even really rubble just lots of dust okay so he moves towards the western door and casts detect magic again nothing I feel no magic beyond this door uh, Gilda listens at the door Nothing. Physic draws his fancy new crossbow. Yeah. Still taking the defend action. She Does he actually opens load it? <laughs> that door. Just, just pulls it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. He pulls it out and throws a uh, an alchemical fire on it. You crack the door to see a uh, long wooden table. It sits in the center of, of a long room, although it is tight quarters, given that uh, it's the table is surrounded by several wooden chairs. Only to the chair to the north seems particularly comfortable, although its cracked leather padding is mostly decayed. Otherwise, you have this 10 foot wide and what, 25 foot long room. And that's it. This is really tight with the table. Mm -hmm. It looks like a really tight meeting room of some kind. There's no evidence of dining in particular. Gilda heads up to the, uh, the, the chair at the head and just kind of investigates it a little bit. Yeah, it's a chair. It's old. It should have should have decayed a lot more a long time ago, but that's about it. Some solid green leather. Uh, Physic would like to t uh, search the walls along the west side of the room for a secret door or any kind of anomaly. And nada. And there's nothing at the table or under the table? Nope. Okay. Okay. Gilda will open the door to the south. And it leads 10 feet forward toward, toward another door. Somebody is getting paid by the door <laughs> around here. She opens the next door. And you crack the door and you are very suddenly in a familiar space where you fought the Morlock scavengers. You can see their dead bodies there just to your left as you walk out. And um, you can tell from this side that that wasn't a wall. It is remarkably, again, well concealed from this side. Interesting. What kind of person lives here that they need so many secret ways to get around? Why couldn't you just <laughs> trust your employees for a hot second here? <laughs> Next thing you know, we're going to find a Scooby-Doo-like portrait with holes in the eyes where you can look out into a dining <laughs> or something. <laughs> Casually makes Scooby-Doo canon. Yeah. Tulak pulls the mask off of Lady Gilda and it's a ghost underneath. Jinkers. <laughs> <laughs> Jinkies. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Physic is Velma of this party. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it never made Hyper sense. Hyper intelligent, but... totally incapable. <laughs> for crying in the beer cheese soup, Fred. Oh, that's good. 
Uh, and I, I'll just throw it out here uh, because you guys can kind of see how the map is constructed. What you found here is two rooms that are insanely well concealed from the outside. You can use this as a safe spot. Big time. Ooh, yeah. Big time. Well, as Physic, if Physic comes out of there, uh, he will, Tulak will close that secret door. Uh, but I feel so sick. <laughs> Physic, come on. Okay. And, uh, but that, that's what's so odd is like, for being so well hidden, they're just so nondescript as rooms. Yeah. It's uh, obviously it's just for like the ease of Belcora, I would think. You know, it's like that's all her private stuff. All the fucking lackeys can go. I mean, they had this old staircase here that's been caved in. So that's probably where the peasants were moving through and the help. And she's just doing her own thing. She is such a fucking deep. Yeah. Or that's where her spy masters came in and left. True. From what we've seen. It looks like she was running an empire or some sort of like this is this is castle esque but inverted. She was yeah. running something from below the city here. So that well hidden entrance, exit, and you know the ability to move around, like to me that that would be where I would hold my meetings with the spy masters. Like there's not a lot of room, but there also can't be. You know, one architect, two diggers would make this room, and then they would all get killed at the end. Hmm. Mm. So what we have is a Nick Cage national treasure for situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This conversation makes me unbelievably excited for you guys to keep going in this adventure. <laughs> uh, there's a uh, there's an obvious metagaming thing in here. Like you know you're in a, uh, a mega dungeon dungeon dive. Like so you know there's lots to come. But like uh, like that perspective that 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 interpretation. It's so good. It's just. Yeah, you're trying to sort out what this used to be, and that's sort of the point, yeah. right, you know? And that's, I mean, with Gilda's lore heraldry, like, she spent a lot of time, you know, specifically, she's she's Andorin, so she's seen rulers yeah. fall, you know, lead from the shadow. She's seen rebellions. She's she spent her whole life enforcing the common rule. So this is, mm -hmm. this is not new stuff to her or her books. It's just upside down. Yeah. Right. And from the research we've already done, there are 24 entries on Belcora. Like, there's a lot to mm. unpack there. So she must have gotten up to some devious shit around the gauntlet. For sure. All right, gentlemen. We found our way out, and we've got four doors ahead of us. Which way do you want to go? I mean, just ca just calculating. Uh, j I just want to do a recap here of of your your directions. You can go. You have doors to your immediate uh, east. You have uh, there is a, a single door uh, down here, uh, uh, south through like the empty rooms that you you did not open yet up yet, and you said uh, brought the uh, thieves back. Um, you also had uh, noped out of this uh, other one where you saw the giant corpse of a, uh, of a purple uh, worm-like creature. And there are double doors north of that that you avoided as well near the toilet. And you saw the spirit and stuff like that, of a, uh, or that the, the message claiming to be from Otari. You have... And the secret door leading down where the spirit went. There's also the one, you know, two other ones, yeah, that lead down from the other ones, yeah. And, and there's the from the way you came in, for the way you came in from the boat. There's also the southern passage you didn't take. You have so many options ahead of you. Yeah. So many ways to get absolutely railroaded <laughs> by this dungeon. Tulak is looking towards the double doors to the west here. Okay. I think those are the ones that Gilda initially wanted to go through, and we uh, ended up fighting some uh, some Morlocks. No, we came the way she wanted to go. Uh, I mean, we did end up fighting the Morlocks over here, but these were the double doors she wanted to go through. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's true. true. Yeah. This yeah. is the room where she totally fucking tanked in. Three hits, yeah. three kills. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> those scavengers didn't stand a chance. Tulak will detect magic at the door. Uh, what's the radius on that again? 30 feet. Uh, yeah, you detect magic. I detect magic Yay. on the other side of these doors. Be ready. Do we hear anything? Nada. 
Do we smell anything? Uh, only yourself, Physic. I believe when we were down south <laughs> west of here in those like bunk area, didn't we hear rummaging? You did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good call. Level up. <laughs> <laughs> He's tapped up in hero points and there's no level ups. <laughs> Okay, she uh, opens the door, I guess. You crack the door to a 30 foot wide by 15 foot, oh no, uh, sorry, 15 foot wide, 30 foot long room where it's apparent that it was originally a kitchen, although the map doesn't quite show that to you. you. Your characters can tell that. The furnishings have been rebuilt and repositioned, however, to create an improvised shrine. The western end of the hall, where a large fireplace for cooking food once stood, now serves as an altar of sorts. Looming over a human corpse is a towering statue in a feminine shape made of bones, covered in sheets of moldering cloth and hanging moss. A bare spot on the room's north wall has been decorated with mud and blood to depict the same feminine form as the statue. Was Nimbaloth a uh, female? You don't know. You gotta do more research. Hmm. Tulak steps into the room. It's quiet, eerie, and a little bit less dusty than most. Can I do a, a religion check on... Um, I mean, this looks like a shrine to me, so... Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'd like to join mm-hmm. Pass on that to see if I can aid. Critical fail. <laughs> Second Is that of the a night. negative aid, or...? <laughs> Do I, do I take a um, minus one? <laughs> no, uh, but you. Uh, unless the joint pass actually has a thing like that, I don't. Actually, I don't know. <laughs> no, but um, uh, you have no idea. It certainly has reminiscence of like what you know about Nimbaloth with the, the moss and everything. It doesn't appear to be specifically Nimbaloth. Maybe something else. Uh, could Physic wander in the room after everybody else and try to take a check himself? Do you need religion or with like an occultism? Uh, right now, it's up to you. Well, in that case, I'm just going to say I rolled a net 20. <laughs> hey! <laughs> oh, no, sorry. I, I stand corrected. Uh, it is a religion. It is a religion. Oh. It is a religion. Net 20 okay. on a religion check. Oh. <laughs> Roll it over. Uh, how about a 17? Well, it's supposed to be a secret check. How about a reduction? <laughs> no, 17 is fine. Um... You, you you surmise that uh, the divinity, quote-unquote, is not of a well-known goddess. That's all you can really get out of it. So you're essentially on the same page as, as Lady Gilda. Like, it seems like Nibeloth, but but maybe, but also kind of doesn't. Okay. Another outer god, maybe. Um, and despite what the map shows, the body is, uh, the, the map shows like a body under cloth, but uh, in this case, uh, I'm going ahead and saying it's not. But as soon as you step in the room, physic, you can see that this is a corpse of a member of the Osprey Club. It is, in fact, bad, bad, a.k.a. Leroy, Leroy bad, Brown. Bad, bad. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> He's the baddest man in the world. Oh. Dead, dead. Yeah. Past tense. <laughs> <sighs> Dead, dead. <laughs> the uh, the upside, the upside, the, uh, it's a sad moment, but the upside is um, Yin Yasmara wanted a report back on Bad Bad's uh, situation, which means you might have a reward waiting for you. Tulak would like to search the room and the altar to see if there's any uh, anything magic. Yeah, I mean, there's there's obvious offerings sitting at the altar, actually. And uh, I've revealed a little little uh, chest for you, a little loot chest. Okay, so Tulak looks inside. There is a weapon potency plus one. Ayo. It's a rune. Yeah, yeah, it's a rune. I uh, I just get that as a freebie. You guys know what it looks like at this point. Weapon potency plus one rune to be attached to weapon if you like. Uh, bloodstone worth ten gold. And there is an unusual flask and an unusual gem. Oh, well, that's unusual. Oh, boy. I'm so sorry. Uh, so he passes the unusual flask and gem to uh, Physic, and we'll join pass with him to attempt to decipher what they are. Uh, okay. Yep, yep. Is that a crafting on each? Uh, you are looking at 
Uh, no crafting on either. Actually, it's going to be knowledge checks for magic. Uh, 25 on my uh, join pass, so plus two to Oof. every roll. Nice. Nice. I hate that. It's like I should have just rolled it, you know? <laughs> yeah, probably because my magic sucks. I mean, you've got, a good, you've got good occultism. Yeah. Yeah, but I just upgraded my crafting and it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I rolled an 18 on the crafting, or sorry, I rolled an 18 on the occultism, which would be a 20. Uh, okay, and which one are you doing it on? The, the flask. The flask. Uh, yep, yeah, you identify it. It is a flask of fellowship. It's a metal drinking flask, four inches in diameter and 10 inches tall. Its screw top is covered by four simple metal cups that nest together. You basically can activate it when you use the make an impression activity. And the effect is that if you share drinks from a flask of fellowship as part of a make an impression action, the drink that pours from the flask happens to be exactly what the target of your efforts would like uh, most to have a dram or two of. So wine, spirits, hot ginger tea, ice cold water with lemon, like whatever it is. Uh, And uh, you get a plus one item bonus to diplomacy checks. Uh, oh, cool. The GM can disallow the use of this based on circumstances, basically across the board. And it's a particular important to note to that it does not intoxicate anyone. It will not alleviate serious thirst. It will not poison in any in any capacity. N- neither one. I think uh, Mr. Tulock is the most diplomatic amongst us, so he should probably hold on to that. Okay, he takes it back and slides it in his pouch. Okay. And uh, what was the other one I'm checking? Gem. Okay, another occultism. If you like. I don't, because it's a 13. Damn it, and I just critically succeeded on the uh, on the aid. 28, natural 20 for 28. So 15. Uh, 15. 15 won't do it. Damn it! Uh, I'll attempt a religion check on it then. That is a 10, so no. And I do not aid. <laughs> okay, I just slide that into the parte loot. I still can't believe bad, badly wrote Brown's gun. I'm sorry for your loss, Physic. I understand he was the baddest man in town. <laughs> <laughs> now he's just the deadest man in this dungeon. <laughs> so far. On the plus side, he left this bad, bad place behind. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you're searching for in this room? I searched the altar, so if you guys want to check out anything, do it up. Just re-emphasizing that there is a uh, the shit shit painting. Yeah, blood, blood, and mud smear on the wall. Yeah. Uh, Gilda will look at it, but I don't, I don't know what check she would possibly roll. She doesn't have like a like human bodily function crafting. Mm. You take a look at it, and it seems so strange for it to be where it's at. Like you're, you're like, you know, it's clearly a, an image of, uh, or a try, uh, an attempt at uh, reproducing the depiction of the shrine, but then the shrine doesn't make much sense either. You're like, what, what, what is the shrine supposed to be? And uh, the only thing you could really gather is that it is a feminine form, uh, or both of them are attempting to be anyway. And um, as you sort of look at it over and over, you see a couple of seams in the wall and you give a little light push and it opens a secret door. Hey! Ooh. And you see a five foot wide hallway, very narrow, with three alcoves on each side. Stone sarcophagi stand upright within each and a door at the far end leads out to the north and as you open the door and take a look in your light from the shield illuminating the space you see a shadow a silhouette of a creature step out from the middle western alcove appeared appearing to possibly be dressed in fine regalia but is all nothing but black silhouette and defined points and these ghostly white and smoking eyes stare down at you. We're going to roll for initiative the next time we record. Oh, you son of a bitch. It's 
Stemming the Tide is an actual play podcast of the Adventure Path Abomination Vaults and is produced by the Uncharted North Network. Stemming the Tide uses trademarks and or copyrights owned by Paizo Inc. used under Paizo's community use policy. We are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. Stemming the Tide is not published, endorsed, or specifically approved by Paizo. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. Music is composed by Will Savino and artwork by Greyhood. Stemming the Tide is recorded remotely using Foundry Virtual Tabletop. If you wish to connect with us or support this project and projects to come, we can be found at unchartednorth.ca, patreon.com slash unchartednorth, and on all major social media platforms. Links to all credits can be found in the episode description and our website. Thanks for tuning in.